We've been talking about a cubed egg the last couple of weeks in relation to the Holy Trinity, and Emma's back there nodding her head furiously. And um, I brought in another cubed egg today because there was a couple of people that said that, you know, they missed it, and I kind of said in my mind, well, if you'd have been with us in worship, you wouldn't have missed it on Sunday, but that's okay. God gives everyone a second chance. And so I brought in another cubed egg this morning, and um, we were talking a bit last week about how all of these people had these different ideas on how that, that cubed egg came to be. Do you want to touch that egg? Is it a real egg? It is. And, and so we had several answers come back about how did that egg become cubed. And yes, even the... I'll, I'll get that after. It is a real egg. It's still chilled if anyone really wanted to eat it. Emma, you want to eat an egg? No, okay, not her favorite thing, but it is a real egg, and so we had several people that came up with different ideas about how this cube egg to be, and I relented, and I said, yes, one of you was actually right, and I pointed out, you know, how we have this, this human need to just have answers and uh, to have everything figured out, and so today I thought what I would, I would bring in, what, what I actually used from my mother-in-law, she gave it to me years ago, similar to the sheets that are outside. You put the egg in, you peel it first. I didn't catch it out of a warm chicken like someone suggested. <laughs> you peel the hard-boiled egg first, you put the egg in, you put the, the lid on top, you screw it down, you put it in the fridge, and it's pressed into a cube. Now we originally started speaking about the egg as representing God, Son, and Holy Spirit, three in one. And when I was thinking about um, bringing this back in again today, I thought, well, you know, this is a press. And isn't that like how life seems to be pressing in on us from all sides? And, we, you know, we get molded along the way, like it or not, we get changed and formed into what God wants us to be. And uh, it can really feel like you're under pressure a lot of times. That's um, an image that I'd like you to keep in mind, not only for the Holy Trinity, but when it feels like the, the walls are pressing in on you and you're getting changed into something that you don't think that you were called to be today as you listen to our message and to our guest speaker. Let's just take a moment in prayer, please. Gracious God, we ask that you silence our hearts and minds this morning as we enter into this time of listening and of hearing with our hearts and minds. May your words sink deep into our souls. Amen. The first scripture reading that Brenda shared with us today was from 1 Kings, and it speaks of widows and orphans and strangers. It speaks of how not paying attention to these people leads to the weakening of an entire nation. And the second reading was Psalm 146, and it sings of how the Lord watches over strangers, upholds the widows and those that are fatherless, lifting up those who are cast down or bowed down, granting vision to those who are blind in many ways, and freeing those who are held captive. We're reminded to rely first and foremost upon God and not upon princes or politicians to do God's work and to provide help. And we are reminded that even while we listen to this message and we listen to God and we do our best to serve others, that in serving we also receive. We both offer and receive much when we live in real communion with other people. The importance of living in real communion is reflected in the last reading from Luke this morning. We see Jesus paying attention once again to people that shouldn't even be on his radar screen. It follows up on our, our message that we shared last week regarding a Roman soldier and a servant. People that normally wouldn't be paid any attention to make it on to Jesus' radar screen. Luke describes the compassion that Jesus has for a mother whose son has died. She doesn't beg for his help. She doesn't come to him. He offers it without even being asked. 
a widow with no other sons in this time, we need to remind ourselves, was without any means of support. If there wasn't another male relative that would, would take her in and provide that shelter and provide that food and clothing, she was cast to the outside of society and all of the, the wealth or worldly goods that she might have collected were turned over to the other side of the family, so she was without. It can be hard for us to imagine, I know, as we have agencies like the YWCA and Project Share and so many other agencies that, that try to step into that gap when there isn't extended family that's, that's able to or willing to help those that are um, being cast out from the center of society. But for the widow that Jesus reaches out to, she hasn't lost just her son. She's in the process of losing everything. Security, loss of respected place in society, even the food that she's going to provide. One thing after another is heaped upon her at the time when she's already mourning the loss of a child. No matter the age of the son, the mother is still alive, and Jesus reaches out to the one who is alive. He sees her need and he takes action. He does the unthinkable and he goes across those boundaries that we've been speaking of that society puts upon us and he reaches out and he touches what's called the, the coffin in some version, the bodies in other verses, but he reaches across and physically touches one that in the process makes him unclean and unworthy in the eyes of those that are surrounding him. He dares to do what other people will not, and he could have chosen to stay on the sidelines and just watch that procession go by, but he chose not to. He demonstrates that God's compassion and mercy extends to everyone. He reminds us to pay attention to those that are on the margins in our own life and in our own society. It's not about an us and them mentality. Many of you have heard me speak about how I just... I don't buy into this us and them where Christians we gather on Sundays and then there's them. This isn't about an us and them. It's about recognizing that we all hunger for different things in our life. We're all in need of shelter of different kinds. We're all in need of compassion and care. And we all have things in our life or in our history that we seek freedom from. We're all thirsty and we seek something that will quench that thirst forever. Jesus Christ is that life-giving water. It washes over us, immerses us, cradles us, and holds us. It restores us, and Jesus Christ brings us new life. It's water that doesn't come bottled or filtered or 329 at the Avondale. It's never-ending, and it's available for all who just reach out and seek that water. Now, each of us here today had a roof over our head last night, and if we wanted to, we could open the refrigerator door and help ourselves to some breakfast. And if for some reason we, we didn't have that, we know that we have a faith community around us where all we need to do is, is pick up the phone or whisper in someone's ear, and we know that that help is going to be provided. For that reason alone, I think we have great reason to celebrate this morning. And I'd like you to listen to the verses 5 through 7 from Psalm 146 once more. Happy are those whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord their God, who made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, who keeps faith forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, and who gives food to the hungry. And I'd like to read to you from Eugene Peterson's The Message, how this is retold. Hallelujah, O oh my soul, praise God. All my life long, I'll praise God. Singing songs to my God as long as I live. Don't put your life in the hands of experts who know nothing of life, of salvation life. Mere humans don't have what it takes alone. When they die, their projects die with them. Instead, get help from the God of Jacob. Put your hope in God and know real blessing. God made sky and soil, sea and all the fish in it. He always does what he says. He defends the wronged, he feeds the hungry. 
frees the prisoners, gives sight to the blind, lifts up those who are fallen. God loves good people, protects strangers, takes the side of orphans and widows, but makes short work of the wicked. God is in charge always. God is good. Hallelujah. So we gather as Christians this morning and each week to worship and to celebrate because we believe this, that God is our hope and our salvation and our strength. And I believe it's such a gift that we have, whether we have the ability to make it into worship on a Sunday morning or whether we're watching from home or whether we're going to hear about this message from somebody else that's passed it along today, that we have such a gift that we're able to share that news with other people. God works through us and gives us wonderful opportunities to demonstrate his love for us in our community. For that reason, I would like to invite Nikki Inch to come forward. Um, she's with the YWCA, and she's going to do a, a brief presentation to let you know a little bit more about what's going on in the community. And I think Brenda's going to have some slides to accompany her. Thank you, Sherry. I really appreciate the opportunity for being able to come out and share with you uh, the YWCA, the work that we do at the YWCA, and also an, about an event that uh, we're going to have coming up in August. So, next. Um, our mission is to empower women uh, and their families by providing supported housing and programs. Our roots have been firmly planted in the Niagara region for over 85 years. We're the largest provider of emergency shelter on, and on any given night, there are over 170 women and their families sleeping under one of our roofs. The YWCA is known for their innovative and award-winning housing programs that move women from poverty and chronic homelessness into stability. We have two 20-bed emergency shelters, one in uh, Niagara Falls and one in St. Catharines. Uh, these are for homeless women and their children. We have one four-unit family shelter, and these are for intact two-parent families, male-led single-parent families, and female-led single parent families with sons who are over 16. We have three phases of transitional housing that is designed to take women who have multiple barriers to housing and to move them into stability. Some women will stay with us for up to four years moving from one program to the next. Women arrive at our doors for a variety of reasons, but poverty is the primary one. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about a woman that um, I met recently. Uh, she was staying at our uh, King Street shelter in, in St. Catharines, and I met her in the dining room. She was eating her lunch, and she told me about her own circumstances. She told me she was working full time at a local restaurant. She had two little girls, one who was six and one who was eight, and she was happy that they were both in school because it meant then that uh, she didn't have to pay daycare or as much for daycare, for full-time daycare, because they were now both in full-time school. And it took a bit of a burden off her financially. She was staying at the shelter because she had nowhere else to go. Her landlord evicted her because she was behind on her rent. She was behind because her car broke down. She needed to fix her car to be able to go to work. But her minimum wage job never allowed her to get enough money to be able to make up her back rent, and so her landlord forced her to leave. She stayed with us for about three weeks before she was able to find a permanent apartment that she was able to move in with her two little girls and never really looked back from there. We, we were able to help her with um, finding an apartment that was within her means, we were able to get her uh, relief on um, 
full market uh, rent for her apartment. It isn't unusual that women head out to work on a daily basis while they're living with us at the shelter. Last year, we served over 40,476 meals to 831 women and their families. Almost 1,000 people accessed our housing programs, and 1,672 women participated in our life skills programs. These are created and delivered in a way that best suits the women that we serve. Some of the programs that they would uh, go to are uh, solutions to anger, uh, women and well-being, addiction support groups, and even budgeting. These programs are offered to our clients at any stage of our housing and have proven to be very effective in moving women into stability. And in fact, over 80% of the women who utilize our off-site transitional housing program are placed in permanent housing, which is unheard of in the shelter uh, uh, services. So now I want to talk to you about No Fixed Address. It's a 24-hour live-in-your-car-a-thon. It's kind of like a marathon or a walk-a-thon, if you've heard about those. Participants uh, will gather up sponsorships from their friends and family and take part in an event that will give them a taste of what it is like to have to live in your car. Over the 24 hours, uh, we will, uh, you will experience how little room a car has when you sleep in it, what a convenience store di diet would be like, and how difficult it is to find a restroom when you most need it. The event is going to be August the 16th and the 17th from 10 a.m. to 10 a.m. It's going to be held again at the Penn Centre parking lot beside HomeSense and Sears. So how will No Fixed Address help the YW? Well, first of all, it will help to raise awareness about the needs of the services that the YW provides. Hidden homelessness is um, something that we, obviously we can't see, or wouldn't be hidden, right? Um, 80% of the homeless population is hidden. And this means that what they're doing is they're staying in cars, they're staying in motels, or they're sleeping on friends' couches and moving from one house to the next. So one of the reasons we're doing this event is to highlight that this is actually indeed a problem in the Niagara area. The other thing is to help raise uh, much needed funds for the YWCA. We ask that each of the participants raise $100 in donations. So this is a snapshot from last year. As you can see, uh, you're not stuck sitting in your car for the entire 25, uh, 24 hours. We realized when we were planning the event that if we forced you to stay in your car the entire time, there was little chance that you would come back and do it again in another year. So we planned lots of activities during the 24 hours. Again this year, we're planning a number of activities. All of them are designed to give you further insight into poverty and homelessness. The, ama the Amazing Race YWCA style is coming back. Uh, we were surprised at the number of children that participated last year, so we're doing quite a few uh, activities that are designed for kids. We have um, the carousel players who are going to come and do a play on homelessness. Uh, we also have an obstacle course, and we have inflatables for the kids to play, late night movie, and music throughout the, the day. So what are some of the ways that you can get involved? Organize a team. Organize a team with your coworkers, or your friends, or your family and get them to help and participate in No Fixed Address. Not only will you be supporting a great cause, but you'll be participating in, in, an, in an experience that will change your life. You can make an in-kind donation. Many goods and services are needed during um, the event to help pull off the, an event of this size. We're looking for um, in-kind donations such as food, snacks for the participants, as well as items to put into our survival kits. 
We're, we're looking for things like flashlights, hand sanitizers, bottles of water, and so on. You can make a monetary donation. Uh, we do have a website if um, that's easier for you to go to. It's uh, nfaniagara.com or you can call one of our shelters uh, located in, uh, well, Niagara Falls obviously would be the one around the corner for you. You can volunteer, um, can help plan the committee, or you can help with set up and tear down. Another way is to help with promotions. Uh, we were very, very fortunate. The Penn Center has uh, offered us a store during the month of August so that we can put up an interactive uh, display about homelessness and poverty, uh, as well as promote no fixed address. We were thrilled with this opportunity uh, to be able to showcase the work that we do here at the YWCA. And we're looking for volunteers to help us uh, operate the store during this time. So you can call 905-988-3528 um, at extension 246 if you are interested in helping with this. Another way you can help is to help out on the day with registration, assist with the activities, serve food, and even direct traffic. So if you'd like to know more about this event, we do have a couple of uh, info nights uh, in June. Uh, on the 13th and the 18th, we're doing one in St. Catharines from 5.30 to 7.30 at 183 King in St. Catharines. And on June 27th, uh, we're doing another one here in Niagara Falls at 6135 Culp, again at 5.30 to 7.30. So uh, thank you very much. I really appreciate it, you allowing me to share with you about our event. Uh, it is uh, certainly our, our main fundraiser of the year, and uh, the funds are much needed, as uh, we all know that everybody's pockets are uh, getting cramped these days with uh, the cutbacks to uh, government funding and uh, other funding that's going on. So uh, this is uh, really, really important in helping us to stay with our own mission. And thank you. Just before we go into our uh, prayers of the people, um, I'd like to, sh to share an experience that I had with you. Um, many of you know that I'm one of the on-call chaplains at the St. Catharines Hospital. And I was there uh, into the very early hours of the morning on, on Tuesday. And as I was getting ready to leave, it was about 4.30 in the morning. The spiritual care office is quite a ways away from the emergency department. And in order to get from one to the other, you have to go through the central lobby. And there's a, I'm not sure if it's a real or a fake fireplace, but anyhow, there's a lovely fireplace um, there, and there's some very comfortable chairs. As I was getting ready to leave, one of the security fellows um, was having to escort some people from the hospital building. While it's a, it's a public building, they can't allow people to sleep there overnight on a regular basis. And um, this wasn't a young couple. Sometimes when we think of hidden homelessness, we think of, you know, those young teenagers that we see panhandling on the streets in the daytime. This was a, an older couple. Um, perhaps they hadn't aged as, as well as some, but I know that they had to be well over the age of 60 or 65. Um, and so this security uh, fellow was having to escort them from the building. They'd had a couple of hours to sleep. He couldn't allow them to remain there because then, you know, heaven forbid, everybody else in the St. Catharines area was going to, to migrate towards that. And they were trying to curb that before out of the cold and everything else started with the winter months. And so it was just last week, actually, that I connected with, uh, with um, the YWCA and Nikki had uh, offered to come and speak. And then on Tuesday, I had this experience of, of you know, these are, these are not young people. You know, they, they might have their reasons for not having a, a roof over their heads at, at 4.30 in the morning on a Tuesday. And the more I thought about that, and I thought, you know, I'd already submitted the hymns, and the next one we're going to sing is, I heard the voice of Jesus. And I thought, okay, I'm always talking about practicing what you preach. 
I know that John Bedell has uh, participated. He's part of the Niagara Online Worship. He's participated in this event in the past, which, again, I didn't, I didn't realize that until after we'd arranged for Nikki to come. And I thought, but, you know, if we're going to practice what we preach, then wouldn't it be wonderful if, if I kind of took that step? I don't like being in a car, but it, with the congregation's support, I absolutely will participate in this event. I know that everyone is, uh, you know, our pockets are getting smaller, as Nikki said. If people were willing to contribute a toonie over the next two months at some point before the event takes place, um, then I will gladly participate in this event. And uh, I think I see Emma at the back there, and I heard that there might be um, some children's activities, so maybe she could even come and visit me at the Penn Centre. So I will leave that with you. I'm not asking for a, a commitment, but I'm telling you that I'm ready as your minister to commit on behalf of Southminster to this event.